My name is Mark Cantor, and I'm going to show you some of the new cool technology we've got set up here. We call it the Media Bar Platform. The idea is that we can see people's faces on the screen, and you can integrate the customer into a whole bunch of different activities. And all those activities become part of a core technology, which we call the Media Bar. Okay, so here's the iconic interface we've got laid out here. And I can drag these icons around and move them on the screen, or I could have the icons represented as words and stack them up along the side of the screen, or we could even have them as icons and we can cascade it. And all these things can be laid out in lots of different ways, however we want to have our interface, okay? So let's go back over here. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the login, and I'm going to show you how we can log in. Okay? So here I am on the screen. Let's call myself um, Charles Aznavour, if you know who he is. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn some lights on here. I'll just kind of look at the screen and go like, hey! We've got a cool little uh, recording of myself. And that will get logged into the system. Now notice over here we've got a debugging screen. And we can find out at any time all the different activities and things that are going on. So uh, we've got what's called a back-end server connected to the system so that we can see all this. Uh, keep track of all the customer records, etc. So here we've got Charles Osnabor loaded into the system, and now I can jump back over here and go look at the face wall, and you'll see that Charles is online now. Okay? So there's Charles right there. He's clued into the system. Now if I really want to find out about him, I can go click here, and up comes what we call a party card. Now you understand this is a works in progress, we're not quite done yet, but we thought that this is so cool, we'd show you the status of things. Now you can imagine having a party card on each of the different people who are online in the system. We're literally seeing it pulled off the server right now, and that picture brought down here. We're imagining that the end customer will write something about themselves like, horseback riding, or tennis, whatever. You talk about your uh, interests, and once you've kind of located a person you're interested in, you then want to send them a message, okay? So now we're going to go to the message screen, and in fact, we've got some people online right now chatting here in the media bar at 701 Rhode Island here in San Francisco, okay? So here we are. I'm going to come back on, and we've got a, a chat server that's handling all the different people, and so I'll come and say, hey guys, I'm back. And of course, you know, it's allowed to have misspelling in a chat. And that shows how excited you are. And, you, know, you really get into it. And pe different people misspell things in different ways, of course. But chatting is only one of the ways that we can interact at the media bar. I want to show you another way. And that would be through something we call the knock-knock interface, all right? Now, of course, again, this is works in progress here. But we'd go over to knock-knock, and we'd be able to have a video phone to interact between people, all right? So we're imagining some really cool things that are going to be possible with the media bar. What I'm going to show you right now is some food and drink ordering. And what you'll see is that, in fact, we did it. We just did a party here, and people were ordering food, and actual food actually came. So these orders get sent as an email to the kitchen, and you'll see that we can uh, have a whole comprehensive uh, food and drink ordering system, music jukebox, video jukebox, all these different activities are all built into the media bar. All right? So here is a different people. And let me first show you our avatar browser. But I could go and assume a different characteristic or personality here. I happen to like Humphrey Bogart. Um, and I'll go move on to the next screen, which will show the actual food and drink ordering. All right? By the way, this interface was done by Joe Sparks, the guy who did Total Distortion. It's really amazing. This company's called Pop Rockets. All right, so here we go. Uh, this food and drink ordering system allows each of the customers to be able to choose uh, uh, from a set of drinks. So let's say, choose some drink. Apple juice. Okay, I'll have some apple juice. Wonderful selection. And maybe over here, somebody beer. wants a beer. Samuel Adams. Okay, he wants a beer. And Bob, maybe he's really into a Coke or something. Coke? But wait a minute. Let me take a look at the code and look at some of the different sort of things we can do with the background screen here. This is fun as well. All right. Now, what we're imagining is that each customer is going to have a very unique set of tastes and interaction. And of course, we're going to capture all that stuff. For espresso, I could go over here and say, well, I want a mocha, uh, espresso. And then Charles over here, maybe he wants some wine. And what he really wants to do is he wants to know, tell me about this Plump Jack Cabernet. Now suddenly, 
the message of the advertiser gets across, and we can in fact have the screen change to a nice rustic background, and of course, the advertiser gets his message across because they knew that I would be willing to spend $28 for a bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon. All right. In fact, I'll take Thank two bottles, you. okay? But oh, if it's a mistake, I can just Love click here Jack. and erase it, okay? All right, now let's go back to our entrees here. And for appetizers, maybe somebody's interested in some prawns. And what I can do is look at a video of the prawns. I love prawns, and I want to make sure that they clean them properly, because it's one of the concerns I have at a restaurant, is that the restaurant properly cleans their prawns, okay? So here I can see a full video of the experience, say, you know, fine, I'll take those prawns. Right? But someone else might be more interested in some olives or something. Say, oh, some beautiful olives. Mmm. Well, how about some green bean salad? Okay. And anytime you can sing along with your menu. Okay, so that's the green bean salad thing. Of course, I'll take some of that. Now, the idea here is that when you can integrate high-resolution multimedia into the experience, you can really start to get on with what else is there to do with interactive TV Hey, wait a minute, I forgot to place the order. See, I was gonna leave before I placed the order, okay? So now the order's being sent to the kitchen and we'll now get that food delivered to us. We have an order. And here we are going back to the interface, which we call the icon bar. Again, remember, I can lay, lay these icons on anyway, and individual screens like this, I could have as an icon and move it around, and in fact, uh, go and click here and bring up a window. Okay, so let me show you some of the other things we can do. I'll drag these icons around, and hey, let's go and listen to some music. Now, the idea of a media bar is that we can have all sorts of different faces built into the interface here. So if Charles wanted to choose a set of songs, he'll go over here, and you know Charles is an old hippie, and he wants to hear some Blind Faith or something like that. And that'll all get built into his profile that's being recorded. So Charles could build up an old a playlist of different songs he was interested in, and that would all get saved off with him. But if I went back to Buddha Boy, Buddha Boy could have his own playlist. And of course, he would choose reggae or different styles of music that are much more apropos to what he's about. I see them lying there, Wayne. <laughs> Add some burning spear and some blondie as well. We'd have our own sort of reggae playlist. Murderer. All right, so that's Buddha Boy. Now, of course, my son Aaron would have his own playlist. And at some point, we'd be able to go off and save these playlists. And let's say Bob wanted to create a playlist, and he really liked reggae, but he didn't just want to choose the regular reggae. He was going to go down and sort by reggae and get all the cool Luciano tunes. In fact, maybe he was so into Luciano that he would go here and sort just by L. He'd go down to Luciano and get just all the Lucianos, OK? Now, once you had a playlist like that, you could save it and store it over here and Call it up later. Okay, here, so we go back now to the icon bar. And let me tell you a little bit about what all these different things represent here. Now, the idea is that camera technology is a core technology, which we call media bar. And it, when we sit down with the corporate client, we may want to put uh, you know, Bob Dole over there, and Al Gore over here, and the White House over there. Or maybe he's a hotel guy and he's laying out a concierge screen. Or you know, There's so many different things that we can do with this sort of environment. You know, we certainly can't do everything all at the same time. So I like to put a bunch of the things we're working on in the back over here. And I could also rep represent these things as words and kind of lay them out along the bottom more or less create my own kind of custom interface. So we're in the business of creating these custom interfaces for our clients. Now, what are our clients? So it's a theme restaurant, or it's someone who's working on a new type of club, or it's a, um, uh, a 
a, a shopping mall attached to a stadium, and you want to have the customers have their smart cards. You know, there's so many different sort of cards that are handed out nowadays, and the future of these cards that you can store your medical information and your tastes and preferences. Now, what we feel that the power of the Media Bar platform has a lot to do with our broadcast system that we're implementing. The idea is that instead of asking the user to fill out a form and ask them their preferences, that you monitor and watch every single thing that the user clicks on. That's why food and video and music are such a core part of our platform, and that we can also have a CD-ROM jukebox, and that any sort of off-the-shelf Macintosh or PC content be played on one of these systems. You know, when Larry Ellison and Scott McNeely tell you about the net computer, or Sony and Nintendo want you to develop for the game machine, they're all asking you to move you onto a different proprietary platform. But what Bill Gates and Apple have done is create a standard set of platforms so that whether it's interactive TV, or network computer, or a handheld device, or a game machine, we should be able to run our software and all these different sort of things. So the media bar platform is sort of like a postscript. It's sort of like a common layer that we can use to uh, so that outside, not in the home, but things that are outside of the home, the location-based stuff, can all share the software. And now, there we are out in the outside world, and the current buzzword du jour is the internet. So every media bar station is an internet station. And we can jump over to Netscape and do email and browse the web, just like any sort of cyber cafe. But the difference is that within the media bar, we have a high-resolution system that can move all sorts of shockwave size files, and even bigger, MPEG files and high-resolution audio within the media bar environment, right? Now, that enables us to actually build an interactive TV system today so that we can use it as a test bed to develop interactive TV for tomorrow. So whether we're at FeedMag, or at Suck, which is one of my favorite sites, or a tie in into some of the websites that connect into the rest of media, the television world, something like the site. Okay, so here we are back at the media bar. Now there's a couple more things I really want to show you. You know, we have a whole video jukebox built in here, and that really answers one of the things that John Malone and all the expectations of interactive TV absolutely insists on, which is video on demand. Now, we don't think that people in a club will want to watch a two-hour movie, but we also think that having each club will want, and restaurant will want to have its own style of content, a kid's place, a cyber youth place, um, something like a cybersmith, which focuses on more retail things, um, and Apple cafes. There's so many different ways to take this technology and position it. What we're trying to do is come up with the core set of activities that people will really want to do. All right, so here's our video jukebox. I want to show you that we can sort by subject, or we could start by artist. And what I'm going to do is create a quick little playlist here of lots of little pieces of video that together become a playlist of video. And we can have it display full screen. And you can also see that we'll have at each media bar station a full regular size TV set. Because we think that's all important to represent you know, the, the type of quality video that we can get. You can't do this sort of video over the internet, and that's the point here. They can sing along with your video. Just sing it. And I'm ready for love. Okay, I'm ready for love too. All right, so let's go back here and we'll climb out of the uh, thing. In fact, let's go back and sort. And let's see, I think there may be some rock videos in here. So let's go through rock videos. You know, a lot of people don't know that I started a band called the Media Band. The idea was to create interactive music videos that would be scalable, so they could work both on a single user station like a CD-ROM, but also a location-based environment like a media bar, and of course also a website. So in fact, we've now got the third iteration of this band, which we call Media Band 3.0, and I'm imagining that this band will play during a live show, the Mark Hanner Show, and I just want to show you the band because it's a really cool band. <coughs> But the idea is that this band will play sort of like a talk show thing, but people now will dial in with the video phones and ask questions while I'm rapping to Steve Jobs or whatever. We have two analog phone lines. We have a 
four balanced audio lines and we have two video lines. Okay, so now what you just saw was the making of my house here at 701 Rhode Island. I want to close by showing you some of the other things because we've got so much stuff in here. And I want to find the CD-ROM jukebox, right? Now what we mean by CD-ROM jukebox is that, of course, the things that started off as a CD-ROM, and unfortunately a lot of my colleagues didn't produce scalable content, but the idea is that it could also be games or executables or any sort of software that runs on a Macintosh or PC. That's what a CD-ROM jukebox is to us. Now, also, when you think about it, it's like the whole reason we're doing this is to be able to create a business that sets up a tent that allows all this cool stuff to constantly be put onto our server. And once a month, we'll give upgrades to our clients and to make sure that they always have the coolest stuff. So, for instance, if I wanted to go choose Meet Media Band, which happens to be one of my favorites, or if I wanted to choose the Hate Ashbury Project, or Total Distortion, all this content could all be linked together with a CD-ROM jukebox. Now, there's a number of other elements we're putting together here. They're not all working yet, but certainly you can imagine that motion video will be coming up on the screen, that ads will be appearing, that each customer's preferences will all be saved off, and a broadcast system will start throwing up messages based upon their history. Remember, this won't be something that filled out in a form. This will be the actual clips of every single thing they did, and that's the Media Bar platform. It was really cool being at the Media Bar .01 sort of preview party the other night. Being able to see people getting down with the system and just the fun of ordering your food in an interactive menu and then being able to get the food right away. I mean, people, when you're hungry, you're hungry and you want to eat. And so I think the high tech stuff is cool, but it also fulfills the basic function of having an interactive menu and an interactive ordering system. It was also fun to see that there were like all kinds of other things that you could do. Sort of like, I got the feeling like in the old days we used to have fun with the jukebox at the side of the table and plugging quarters in there, listening to a few hits. Now you can have a multimedia jukebox, listen to songs, watch videos, play games. Some people were like playing uh, Residence uh, Strange stuff. I mean, there was really some bizarre software going on in the background. Everybody got to put their picture up, so you got a sort of sense of community about who was there, who you were getting down with, who the other party members were, and that was a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that's also really cool about the media bar technology in general is to be able to have something where it's not just point, click, and wait, and you really get that speed of instantaneousness, both in the digital world on the network itself and in the analog world where you can connect with other people who are there, have waitresses and waiters scurrying by with your drinks and your food. So it really does sort of fulfill that hyperactive mode of the 90s that we're all getting caught up in in our kind of nanosecond culture. And the web interactivity is like type in some words in the text field to hit the carriage return. That's interactivity. Well, or if the text disappears from the screen yeah. after you hit the carriage return. Well, yeah, you can yeah. say that's interactive. And, and it's not carriage return, really. It's hit the submit button. Yeah. Submit, yeah. Submit, yeah. Submit, yeah. Um, <laughs> with all the implications of the you know, submits to the information superhighway. Hi, this is Mark Cantor. Welcome to the Mark Cantor Show.
Now I want you to know, this is not one of those normal kind of Tom Brokaw kind of things. Here we're going to be diving into the internet, checking out what's going on behind the scenes. You got the hackers hacking on the systems, you got the guys down in the lot working on the digitizing, you got the programmers up in Silicon Valley, those are all my connects. We're going to cut through the bullshit, we're going to focus on what's important to business, not what they want you to know. We're going to focus on what's really important to people and all the things that really create great compelling experiences. So the Mark Cantor Show could be available on the web, it could be on a CD-ROM, traditional television broadcast, it doesn't matter because the content itself is scalable. Now you know in Hollywood they can take a film, they've got theatrical rights, cable rights, videotape, they've got a lot of ways to make the money back. But in our interactive business, we actually call it the CD-ROM business. You know, you have to understand that the content has to kind of exists as an ethereal bubble and it gets personified in a lot of different ways. That's the problem, is that the technology's been driving what the content is. I'd rather have the content define what the technology is. You see, we're out there pushing the envelope, trying to understand what's going on, cutting through the bullshit for you, the viewer, because that's what matters. Here are the five segments of the Mark Cantor Show. Unlike a traditional TV show, we don't just broadcast the episodes once. They're all archived. They're up there. That's really taking advantage of the website. All right? Now, I could actually change the material at any time, travel around the world, making reports, and that's what the global scene is about. This, this is Mark Cantor, going back to the hotel of Mark Cantor. Cantor. Or I could be writing things about Bill Gates or what really matters to me, and that's the read between the lines segment. As the world of multimedia grows and all the cool content comes out, things like Psychic Detective, hey, I could report about that in the content of the week. Or I could be interviewing my friends, Fred Davis or anybody else, Steve Jobs, who knows? I Maybe I'll even have Bill Gates on here one day. We're building a database of entertainment information that can be accessed and used. Some of the background information, the outtakes, longer lengths of the interviews, those will all be available on CD-ROM and other things. See, that's the point of scalable content, is that we're really leveraging off of what the assets are, in this case, Mark Cantor. One of the things that really fascinates me is how people and technology are intersecting together and the technology is driving the people and the people are driving the technology. You know, we're going to be doing interviews with some of the really important people in this industry and one of those people is Fred Davis. Now Fred is someone who's played the corporate game, he's got an amazing website now, he's been an editor, done all those things. He's really putting together art and commerce. Here we are in Fred's orchid room, and it's like it's kind of like a cool house. It's like where all the orchids are grown. Yeah, I, I love orchids. It's a great balance for computers. It's that yin yang thing. You've got the high tech on the one hand, the total frenzied nature of the computer industry. And then you have orchids, which take seven years from seed to their first flower that are on a whole different time span. Different it's cycle. a really good balance. And Fred, you've got your whole house wired. Explain your net. Oh, yeah, little man, I'm going to have to jump around here for a sec just to fully show it off because I love surprising people by showing them the closet in the basement now. I've got the server with 32 megs of RAM and 4 gigabytes of hard disk God, space. Yes. I've got ISDN on here. I've got my ISDN link, the laptop, the server, the comm workstation, all the computers in the house, which are about 10 right now, are all connected on Ethernet, running at about 10 megabits per second. So here we are down in the web scene, and we're about to see the merger of the web and multimedia. Okay, so when you're going to be able to put Shockwave or director files or applets with Java or any of these new things. What it is is it's a layer on top of the net. That right here is today's net where it's mostly text or I go back to a page and I can make it look pretty by saying, okay, put some graphics at the top of the page and do some simple things. But still, it's a text and graphics two-dimensional right. medium. It's sort of where we were like in 1985, right? We've got page maker. Right. Oh my god, I put a graphic and text. Right. Or even earlier, where in the labs in the early 80s or late 70s, people were playing around with graphics and the page was coming alive and it was an exciting time. Now what's going to happen is the net is going to come alive. Bandwidth is increasing slowly, but what's increased more is creativity and the opportunity on the net. And the two of those things have driven Netscape from obscurity to a multi-billion dollar company. The internet, that's the current buzzword du jour. Everyone wishes that it could just solve their problems. It, it's great, it's important, it connects everything together. As the data changes, then we can be connected. But if it's just text and graphics, we're still limited. We have to have the multimedia aspects of the internet. It has to grow to where at home is going with the cable modals and broadband distribution to eventually move us from the single user era to the multi-user era. That's what the internet is about. Don't get worried about the fact that the Netscape is too slow and da-da-da and you're waiting. The world gets better. The hardware guys don't retire. 
when people go to watch something on their interactive TV of the future, it's going to be, we're, we're prototyping that in low res today. Right. And that the really exciting thing about it is that there'll never be 500 channels. There'll be 50,000 or however many people want to do. Because whoever wants to put up a server is going to have their own channel. Right. And it's not going to be constricted by your Ted Turners and your General Electrics and whoever, anybody with a server could put it on. And that's what's so freaky to the power establishment about the internet, and whether it's on the internet or a private network or whatever, that model is here to stay. Because they can't control it. Because they can't control it. Right. If you want to watch the Mark Cantor show, you'll be able to. Of course, the downside is if you want to watch the Mark Furman show, right. you'll be able to watch Absolutely. that too. Right. But that's what freedom of the press is all about. Monomedia is still just as important as multimedia, because those are the building blocks you use it in. So you've got to have good writing, good art, and good music. and good orchid grown. Absolutely. I'll give you a perfect example of how people influence technology. Now look at a guy like Steve Jobs. Here he's invented the Macintosh, then he helps build object-oriented programming and stuff, but now it's not just he built some cool tools at Pixar, it's the fact that he put creative people together with those tools. Now we got Toy Story. Okay, so here we are at Content of the Week. Are we rolling? Okay, here we are at the Content of the Week segment. Now we're going to focus on a product called The Individualist, but unlike other websites, we're not simply going to, going to give it a little review, a little Siskel and Ebert sort of thing, or like a TV show, you know, sort of give it a little fluffy kind of, oh, isn't this a wonderful product approach, okay? What we're going to do is look at the why behind the product. Why was it created? What was Todd thinking about when he did this? What's the technology underneath it? Other reviews will give you the actual personification of the product. I'm looking at what was the philosophy behind it. Everyone wants to be able to say that their product is interactive, whether or not they've really elevated uh, the ante at all. If you look at this Bob Dylan desk, it's just horrible. I mean, why would I want to click on the coffee cup to start blowing in the wind? I mean, what the hell does that, you know? Well, unfortunately, that decision was made for you about, you know, what you would click on to get it. Um, and again, it gets back to this sort of um, argument about what do people really want. Um, a lot of people who get involved in interactivity have bought into the argument that um, that there is a great desire already there on the part of the audience to do more. And uh, for the most part, the audience is not aware of what's possible, so they don't have that great desire to do more. And all of these um, clever kind of, you know, game structures, as much as they satisfy, you know, the 14, 15 year old male's desire for some challenge, don't reveal to the audience at large what it is that they haven't already gotten out of the artist. This is really different than No World Order. I mean, this is really a real growth beyond that. Well, The Individualist is not an interactive music disc per se, uh, in that, um, by my definition of interactive music. So there are some things that are, um, uh, let's say, linear. And then there are some things that are um, uh, you can take control of. Like, for instance, we have a little interactive game there for Castle for a Stone. You can actually uh, navigate around the space and throw stones at the various personalities. And in some cases, in our own uh, Dave VR, the replacement for QuickTime VR, you can take interactive control of that and explore the environments that are in that. Okay, so tell me about this Dave thing. What's that? Dave is the digital anamorphic video engine. But the core is an engine that allows for all rhythmic generation of animation, right? Real-time real -time graphics, uh, along with uh, synchronous Red Book audio playback. Ion has been working in addition to creating content to create tools to allow other developers to create enhanced CDs as well. But to find the solutions, you have to figure out the problem. Right. So we use we use our own productions as test beds for the uh, enhanced uh, CD tools. So you guys call this the Enhanced Toolkit CD, the Enhanced CD thing? Or? It's uh, the Macromedia Enhanced CD Toolkit, uh, and it's specifically uh, made for Director, and uh, the X objects were uh, produced here at ION, um, and also we're working with some Director uh, documents that, uh, that are written on top of the X objects that'll give director, developers, all the information they need to be able to use the X objects in their own titles. So we've got this um, multi-layered virtual environment creation engine that uh, is high performance and cross-platform and essentially allowed us to um, 
uh, to make a little bit of data look like it lasts a long time. When Bill Gates wakes up in the morning time, he focuses on business and sort of this whole sort of left brain approach to life. The balance of art and commerce is this ongoing battle. And what the cyber youth are noticing is that all this marketing stuff and everything that's taking over the web is continuing this oppression of the people and the separation of those who have and those who have not. So of course the cyber youth are going to be the anarchist hackers. They're going to be people who are going to pierce their lips, dye their hair blue, and they're the future. They're the people that Bill Gates doesn't understand. The next rock and roll is this sort of cyber art revolution because we've got the free distribution channels now, all right? We don't have to go to some foolish guy and schmooze him up and get onto a shelf space. We don't have to play the game of heavy financing. You can sit there with your little quarter pack and a computer and you can have your own TV show, you can have your own channel. So that's the revolution that Bill Gates can't stop. A visionary sees change before the masses even suspect such a change is possible. Mark Cantor is a visionary. Three years ago, he began a creative project founded on the concept that in order for interactive entertainment to succeed, someone would have to actually define interactive content. And that creating strong content would compel audiences to interact, to experience a unique art form in new venues whether it be CD-ROMs, live interactive performances, or at home on interactive television. Meet Media Band is Cantor Technology's first title release. Combining the talents of two performing songwriters, Chris Watkins and Kelly Gabriel, with a team of writers, animators, and artists, Cantor formed a cybernetic band, a media band. Meet Media Band is a glimpse into the multimedia landscape of tomorrow, where compelling interaction isn't just possible, it's essential. Enter an ether rave environment, where states of mind become reality, and where fantasy rules. Each turn of the head and click of the mouse brings you to successive, surreal rooms of the rave. And each room is a gateway to nested artwork, video, animations, and music. The core experience of Meet Media Band is found on the cyber stage. Here is where Media Band invites you to perform and experience their first two interactive music videos, House Jam and Undo Me. Both pieces have unique interactive styles, and both can be viewed passively. But the moment you get involved, the music video switches into high gear, and you're in control. House Jam is a combination of Pan ethnic musics and visuals which respond to manipulation like a video game. With the advent of sampling and multiculturalism, no culture is truly indigenous anymore. We sample, therefore we are. House Jam lets you become international mix master, jumping from style to style and creating your own music video in real time. Remember, if it moves, click it. Isolate the true visionaries. Undo Me is completely different, as singer Kelly Gabriel confides in you about four different relationships. First, you choose one of the guys for her to start the relationship with, and the first verse for each path is their first encounter. At each chorus break, you can have Kelly proceed passively or aggressively, altering the relationship and the song. You can also go forwards and backwards in time, changing your mind and seeing the results. And, unlike real life, you can just undo the whole thing and start again. Exploring the other areas of the ether rave takes you further into the world of media band. The techno room lets you go behind the machines and mix it up with the wire heads. Comments from the media band creators let you in on the essentials of multimedia. Flowcharts galore explain the obscure. And floating nerds are accessible for random comments. A picture is worth a thousand. Travel over to the smart bar and listen in on the cyber set at play. Just how smart do those smart Sorry, drinks make you? Unlike the rest of the techno world, Media Band doesn't take themselves totally seriously. As rock videos were to cable. Delve into the cryptic archives, an Alexandria library of media and messages featuring source works from Media Band artists. 
graphic animations from designer Jim Collins, the electronic sketchbooks of animator Stuart Sharp, the rubber dub mixings of Mark Cantor, the complete media band screenplay by writer Michael Kaplan, and video art from director John Sanborn. Meet Media Band is a groundbreaking interactive title, distinctly different and totally cutting edge. It's not about dead ends or puzzles or repurposed product. It's not about scrolling through endless empty hallways. It's not about winning and losing. This is pure interactive entertainment which defies definition. It's a combination of song, visuals, video, and game. And remember, with Media Band, the more you click, the weirder it gets.